So let's talk about backplates. Now, backplates aren't a lighting technique, um, but you'll probably see some images and just think, how the hell did they do that? Um, and I'm going to sort of talk you through this now because it is a, a fundamental to photography, especially still life work and moving image, but it's particularly important for commercial clients who change their mind after the fact. Now, what it means is shooting on a tripod completely locked off with artificial light, which is completely controllable, and having your settings as well as your focus completely manually set so nothing can deviate. Once you have your setup ready, you take a shot of just the background, and that is your back plate. Now, it will have anything in there which doesn't move. And there's a few reasons you might do this. One is the client goes afterwards, can you move the can of Coke three inches to the left? If you've already got all of that background information, it's a simple care of a simple case even of duplicating the layers in Photoshop and then just creating a layer mask and dragging it along. It's pretty straightforward, even I can do it. There's some great YouTube tutorials which do a better job of explaining it than I do, but it is straightforward. The other reason is if you're making a messy shot like the champagne pour, the only way that we could have got that right, because obviously we had to pour that champagne time after time after time and also it was lemonade and apple juice, but we had to keep pouring it in until we got the right splash. And obviously by the time we got the right splash, the entire set was just destroyed with it. So we made sure we had that perfect back plate. And all we did was brush in the areas where we needed that perfect background to come back in again. Same with the glasses being all wet and smeared down the side. Just a really simple, quick way to do it. It also meant that we could fill all three glasses and have the perfect fizz coming out of all, but the one which is spilling over in the same shot. Otherwise we'd have to have poured we would need a three-man team. Two people pouring the first two and the third person pouring the final one. And even then we'd be relying on getting it right the first time. And similar so for the, for the shot of the, 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 uh, the, the milkshake. I've got a Boris Johnson there. Um, we used a, a spigot and we hot glued the glass onto it. And to make sure we had the information, because obviously the background's not completely even, it's slightly gradated, we shot a back plate where we took it out and photographed it too and brushed it through. So I'm going to pop some of these up on the screen so you can have a quick look at what they look like at their various stages of being unedited. Because sometimes you'll see the final image and you'll see your capture on set and go, good lord, that doesn't look as good as these people's do. But a lot of it is in post-production, which is why my next actual workshop is going to be in digital workflow and post-production. But a lot of it goes into there. But knowing how to create the assets in advance is so important. Okay, so let's look at these photos. Let's look at these photos in a bit more detail. This is Capture. This is, I say Capture, not as in Capture One. Um, why am I using Lightroom today? Good question. Not sure. Anyway, this is my CR2 raw file straight out of camera. This is what we collected, um, 400 ISO, F925. The reason it's 400 ISO is because the lights I used here were just cheap speed lights, I think. Um, you can see it's so little flash that actually picking up the lights in the ceiling. Uh, but that's our capture. The paper's a bit bobbly, we're missing a bit at the top. And I send this off to my retoucher along with a frame just of the background with nothing else in there. And he returns something along these lines. And then I add the color grade, and the crop and we end up here. So we've gone from what looks like a bit of a mess, but you can sort of see the potential in there if I just change a few sliders to a final image, which is, you know, it's quite, quite a long way away from one another, but that is the same frame. This is a single shot to get the splash. Um, we didn't add anything here. We was just removing this area here, but having the background already in shot just makes it that little bit easier just to go brush, 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 rather than getting the clone stamp out and causing all sorts of chaos. Um, so there's that. Now, the next shot I want to talk to you about is this one here. This is, I love this shot, F10, 250 ISO. We didn't need as much light this time because we're shooting through a clear liquid and the background was going to be very dark anyway. It's just a web res version. Um, hundredth of a second and the emotion is frozen. But by the end of the shoot, is a CR2 raw file. This is what we were dealing with. Uh, and you can see also we've changed the colour of the paper at the bottom. I say we have, Rob did. Or Drew, not sure who did this one. Um, but you can see the chaos we had. So we started off like this. We shot the set. Now I'd already put some glasses in there to make sure they worked okay and filled them up, but we, we took them out again to get the first back plate. The focus is set. Here's our first frame. This means that if we spill stuff all over here, it doesn't matter. I then add the back glasses front glass and I start pouring. 
And then what I did was I made sure I'd got a perfect fizzing bit out of each frame. And then we started adding the splashes. And you can see how it just destroys the set. And these two go completely flat. And we just don't stand a chance of getting anything usable from a single frame. And that's fine. There is no, no reason to do that. And again, this is just bare bulb um, or spill kill. And there's our final frame. You see, the, the fizz is still here. And the fizz is still here. So we've got the back plate as one frame. That's the second frame for this one. That's the third frame for this one. And then I seem to remember we took this splash from one frame, this splash over the side from another, the glass from another, and the pouring section from a completely different one. Because what gave a good splash in the glass gave a really bad pour like this. And it's not cheating. This is our job. This is what we do. This is how photography works. Um, it's why I always use a tripod, because it gives me these options. That's not to say you have to do this if you want to be a photographer, but this is how the commercial world of photography works. This is how we shoot everything. There's always a back plate. There's always an option, especially once we're bringing mess in. I mean, how else, unless I just took the first frame, could I possibly make this look good? when it ends up looking like absolute chaos after just a couple of pours and these are dead in order to get that extra little something. And yes, it's not necessarily lighting. And I know this is a lighting workshop, but this is, it all ties into one. There's no, it's very hard to uh, subtract each area of photography and to make it just like this is just light because this is part of lighting making sure your light is consistent making sure you light the scene and you get the back plates making sure you do things like if we sometimes need something to be not as bright we'll just pop a flag right in the frame here and take a second frame just of this bit here with a flag in the frame with the back plate and we'll just brush that bad boy out it happens all the time almost on every shoot Anyway, I hope that helps understand backplates. Let's crack on with the next bit.